Good morning, once again. Good to see everybody. Can I have you turn with me in your Bibles to the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 23? Almost done with 2 Samuel. I'm going to be starting 3 Samuel next week. You don't have a 3 Samuel? We got a problem. No, I don't either. Well, well, we're praying about what the Lord will have us do. Uh, but this morning, we come in our study of 2 Samuel to chapter 23, verses 1 to 7, a section that is called David's Last Words. Now, before we look at David's final words, let me just say that today it seems we are surrounded by a constant chorus of talking heads in the form of pundits and commentators on TV, talk radio, and the internet. All of these uh, mediums have provided a platform or a soapbox from which these people can spew a constant stream of trivial and even meaning meaningless drivel into our lives. One day as I was preparing a study in the book of Joshua, I was looking at Joshua's farewell address. And it hit me that when a person is saying goodbye to the people that matter most to them, they're not going to waste their words with meaningless chit-chat, you know, right? I mean, you know, you're, you know you haven't got much longer to live. And you gather to your bedside or hospital bed the people you love, your family, your close friends. You going to talk about the weather or sports or even business at that time? I don't think so. I don't think so. Most people are going to want to pass along to the people they love the most the things that they've learned over the course of their life, the things that really matter, things that are important, you know? They're going to try to condense the most important lessons they've learned over the course of their life into a few sentences or statements and to pass those along to the people they care about in a concise way. Here we see in our text this morning the final words of David. And we see in his final words that very thing we're talking about, how he wants to pass along to the people he loves, probably the nation of Israel, uh, but of course to all of God's people, the lessons that David has learned over the course of his life that were important. These are words that really matter. The title of this message, Words That Matter. So verse 1, now these are the last words of David. Thus says David, the son of Jesse, Thus says the man raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel. So here in verse 1, David identifies himself as the one who actually penned these words. But in verse 2, he tells us who actually gave him the words that he wrote down. Verse 2, the spirit of the Lord spoke by me and his word was on my tongue. So even though these are some of the last words of David, I'm not saying he spoke them from his deathbed, but sometime just prior to his death, um, and he acknowledges right here that they're inspired by the Holy Spirit. So obviously these are words that we really need to pay attention to. It's like the Spirit of God is telling us, look, I've got some important things to say to you. Listen up and He's using David to do that. And the first thing that David, uh, as the current king of Israel, wants to express in these final words of wisdom, listen, is how important godly leadership is to a nation. Now, he's a king, and so obviously he's going to want to pass along words of wisdom to other kings and leaders and so on. He said in verse 3, The God of Israel said, the, the rock of Israel spoke to me, He who rules over men must be just ruling in the fear of God. As I said, David was a king. He took over for King Saul as king of Israel. You know, Saul didn't rule in the fear of God. We've studied Saul's life from 1 Samuel pretty much. But uh, Saul didn't rule in the fear of God. Uh, Saul abused his power. He was the typical politician who rewarded his allies and punished his enemies. I'm talking about fellow Jews now. He was the kind of a guy that if you could do something for him, it was quid pro quo, this for that. That if he, he would do for you if you could do something for him in return. That is the majority of our politicians today. 
they don't really do for people, not all, but most, they don't really do for people because it's the right thing to do to help people. They always will, you know, gather to themselves the folks that will help them the most and then they target them to bless the most. Also, we, as we studied Saul's life, he wasn't a man that fully obeyed God. God would tell him to do something, he wouldn't fully obey. Why? Because he wanted to do things to please people. That would ingratiate him to people so that, again, they would support him as king and leader. And so whenever God told Saul to do something, you know, he never really did it. He always had a better way. And um, then when God confronted him, well, the people, they wanted this or they would have stoned me or whatever. So he was a people pleaser, a man pleaser, the worst kind of a leader. Saul the, Paul the Apostles in Galatians 1 verse 10, if I seek to please men, I'm no longer a servant of Christ. As a leader, you have to decide right here and now, if you're going to lead God's people or any people, you have to ask yourself, if I, am I going to be a God pleaser or a man pleaser? Paul said you can't be both. Now, if you really serve God with all your heart, guess what? You will serve the people in the right way. My goal is to serve the Lord Jesus Christ to the best of my ability, so help me God, because when I love the Lord and I do what He wants me to do, He's the good shepherd. He's going to want me to take care of you guys, but not to tell you what you want to hear to placate you, that you support me more. I'm going to tell you what you need to hear, not necessarily what you want to hear, because that's how you grow. Now, David is saying, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that those who rule over people must be just, righteous, not corrupt. And they must rule in the fear of God. Guys, ruling in the fear of God means that a good ruler will honor God's word and govern his people according to its precepts and commandments. He will not take a bribe to pervert justice, nor show favoritism to the rich over the poor, in a civil matter. He does what's right because he knows that someday he will have to stand before the great king and judge of all the earth and give an account as to how he led those people that were under him. And guys, listen, if he's a good leader, he's going to take that or she's going to take that into consideration. It's going to produce in them a godly fear which will impact and underpin the way he or she rules over others. One author said this, and I quote, Without righteousness and the fear of God, a leader becomes a dictator and abuses God's people, driving them like cattle instead of leading them like sheep. David was a ruler who served as a servant who ruled, and, and uh, excuse me, David was a ruler who served and a servant who ruled. And he had the welfare of his people always on his heart. It encourages me today to see that even secular business specialists are comparing effective leaders to shepherds who care, end quote. Verse 4, talking about a man that leads in the fear of God. He shall be like the light of the morning when the sun rises, a morning without clouds, like the tender grass springing out of the earth by clear shining after rain. David will often wax eloquent, poetic. He's the sweet psalmist of Israel. He wrote half the psalms in the book of Psalms. And the idea behind the poetic language David is using here is that when a ruler rules, when a ruler rules, <laughs> let me try that again slowly. When a ruler rules righteously in the fear of the Lord, listen, it's going to usher in a new period of opportunity, growth, and blessing for his people. Why? Because he will bathe them, bathe them in the light of God's truth, and they will flourish like the green grass after the rain. Again, another commentator said, and I quote, For well-watered seedlings to fulfill their potential, they must have bright sunlight. Uh, they must have bright sunlight. Similarly, strong, righteous leaders help create an environment in which the people under their care can fulfill their potential, end quote. Now, verse 5, David becomes a little introspective. He says the first part of verse 5, although my house is not so with God. David is admitting that he has not always lived the righteous kind of a life that he described in verse 4, a good king or leader needs to live. 
He said in verse 5, Although my house is not so with God, he has made, uh, yet he has made with me an everlasting covenant ordered in all things and secure. Let me stop there. You see, even though David was imperfect, we've all seen that as we studied his life. David was not a perfect man. He did some pretty bad things over the course of his life. He committed adultery and murder. Yet he was assured that God would still fulfill his promise to him. You say, what promise? Well, turn back to 2 Samuel 7. While you're turning there, remember how that at one point, David wanted to build God a new house, a temple. Uh, God had been living in a tent for many, many years. David had just filled it, finished building himself a beautiful cedar palace. And he looks out his window and sees the Ark of the Covenant in a tent still. And he gets kind of convicted. And so he tells Nathan, the prophet, his good friend, I want to build God a house. And Nathan thought that was a great idea. And said, go for it, David. Do all this in your heart. And then Nathan went home and God spoke to him and said, Nathan, you're going to go back and tell David, he can't build me a house. He's a man of war. He shed too much blood. But you tell David because it was in his heart to do it and he wanted to do it, I'm going to build him a house. And he didn't mean a brick and mortar place. He meant a dynasty that would last forever. We pick it up in 2 Samuel, verse, uh, 2 Samuel verse, uh, 7, verse 12. God says, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your own body and will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. Talk, just talk about Solomon primarily right here. You can't build me a house, David, but Solomon, your son, he's going to build me a temple, all right? And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men, but my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. So God is promising David that he was going to have a descendant that would sit on the throne of Israel forever. Now, how could David be sure, though, that God would keep his promise to him even though he had blown it so many times? David could be sure because, listen, the promise wasn't dependent on David's faithfulness. It was dependent on God's faithfulness. This was an unconditional, unilateral covenant. A covenant is a promise, a solemn promise, okay? But God made David a unilateral, unconditional covenant that would ultimately be filled, yes, by the Messiah, who would be a descendant of David. One of the messianic titles for Jesus Christ is Son of David. Going back to this very place in 2 Samuel 7, where God promises that from David's own loins would come one who would sit on the throne of Israel forever. He would come someday, the Messiah, of course, bring a kingdom and would reign over the whole earth from Jerusalem. Again, verse 5, at the end there, so he's, after he talks about how God made an everlasting covenant with me and ordered in all things and secure, for this is all my salvation and all my desire, will he not make it increase? This is, all I'm, this is what I'm living for, this promise of God. The NIV translates the last part of verse 5, and I quote, Has he not made an everlasting covenant arranged and secure in every part? Will he not bring to fruition my salvation? and grant me my every desire. Now, guys, these are the final words of David inspired by the Holy Spirit. So obviously, the Holy Spirit wants us to key in on these words. The first thing that David teaches us after a godly leadership, how important that is, is about how God keeps his promises or his covenants. Here, of course, the Davidic covenant and how God kept that by bringing Messiah eventually through the line of David. But the Bible says that our God is a covenant-keeping God. And he has made a covenant with all of us. We need to understand covenants for a second. Let's stop and talk about covenants since they're so important. And since they're one of the final things that the Holy Spirit wanted to speak through David about, we need to understand them. Guys, there are two kinds of covenants in the Bible. There are bilateral covenants and unilateral covenants. 
A bilateral covenant is a conditional covenant where two parties enter into an arrangement or an agreement uh, with each other to each fulfill a part of the covenant. And so you have two men that enter into this covenant. They're both going to put in half the money to buy, a, to start a business, we'll say. And um, the, the contract, uh, then there'll be mutual partners and owners. But the covenant depends on both fulfilling their, the terms of the covenant. So if only one provides money to buy this business and the other one d does not, the covenant is rendered null and void. Because in a conditional bilateral covenant, you have to have both parties faithful to observing or keeping their part of the covenant. That's why it's called a conditional covenant. It's a two-party contract. An example of a bilateral covenant would be the Mosaic Covenant. You remember how God spoke to his people from Mount Sinai saying that he wanted to enter into a covenant with them. And they thought that was a great idea. And God says, look, I will bless you beyond any people on the face of the earth if you will obey my commandments. Bilateral covenant. God says, I will bless you if, here's the condition, you obey all that I have said. If you do not obey what I have said, not only will I not bless you, here are the curses that will come upon you. You can read Deuteronomy 27 and 8. A unilateral covenant, guys, is a one-party contract or agreement. It's unconditional because it only has one person. Listen, it only has one person making a promise to another person. A promise that has no terms that they have to fulfill to receive the benefits of this kind of covenant. A good example of a unilateral covenant would be a will, as in a last will and testament, right? In most wills, I can't speak for all of them, but I am certain that most wills are unilateral covenants, where the person who has drawn up the will has promised people certain things when he or she dies. Uh, you know, I promise you, I'm, I'm written in my will that when I die, you, whoever it is, uh, you're going to receive my Elvis record collection. <laughs> which I don't have, but get the idea. Now, you don't have to do anything. I just have to die. You don't have to do anything <laughs> to receive what I'm promising you. There's no term. I didn't say, if you do this or that, you'll get the collection. It's simply, I promise to do something for you or give something to you once I die. It's a one-party contract. It's unilateral, unconditional. You have no terms to fulfill. See, this is the language we see God using in 2 Samuel 7 when he made this covenant with David and his family. Let me read again verses 14 to 16. I will be his father. Now, God is focusing primarily now on David's son Solomon, who would re replace him as king when David died. I will be his father. He shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. Do you see any terms that God specified in this promise? No, he didn't say, David, I'm going to promise you that you're going to have a descendant, i.e. Messiah, who will sit on the throne of Israel forever if you do this or your descendants do this. There was no terms. There was no conditions. David and his descendants had nothing to fulfill, no terms to keep, to be the recipients of the benefits of this promise by God, to be again the family through whom Messiah would be born. It was not dependent upon David or his descendants' faithfulness, but depended solely on God's faithfulness to fulfill the terms of this covenant, therefore was unconditional. Now, guys, I bring this up. Because this is exactly the kind of covenant that God made with his church through his son, Jesus Christ. It's a unilateral, unconditional covenant called the new covenant. The new covenant. I'll just read these to you. Luke 22, verse 20. This is in the upper room the night before Jesus went to the cross. He's observing communion with his disciples. At one point, verse 20, it says, Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, 
This cup is the new covenant, which is in my blood shed for you. What is this new covenant? Would they have understood what he was talking about? Certainly they would have. Because in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31, God talked about this new covenant that he was going to bring someday. Well, hang on to that thought. We'll get back to it in a moment. But Paul, in writing in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 6, he says, Jesus also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. What's he talking about? The letter of the law, the Mosaic covenant, uh, that killed. It didn't bring, the Mosaic covenant was never really designed to bring life because the law couldn't save us. To be saved by keeping the law, we're going to talk about that more in a second, you'd have to keep all of it perfectly all your life. Therefore, as Paul brings out very clearly in Romans 3 and 4, he said the law was only given by God not to make us righteous, but to show us how unrighteous we really are because we can't keep it. Think of the Ten Commandments for the, just to help you get your mind around it. Paul said, look, Nobody can keep the Ten Commandments perfectly. The law was not given to make us righteous, but to show our sinfulness, to drive us to God on our knees for another way to be saved. The law can't do it. So we are, the law drives us to God to say, Lord, please, is there another way? Jesus came and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. We are now the ministers of a new covenant. The law under Moses killed the spirit of grace through the gospel gives life. That's our ministry, to go into all the world and preach the good news to every person, right? Guys, listen to me. And I've talked about this before, so if you've heard me teach this, just hang in there. If the new covenant had been a bilateral covenant where God promised to give us eternal life if, underline that word, if, we kept our part of the co covenant, what would be our part of the covenant? Well, if you're going to get to heaven apart from Christ, then our part of the covenant would have to be to keep the law perfectly every single day of our life. James said in chapter 2, verse 10, I believe, if you keep God's law perfectly your whole life but violate just one law, you're done. You're done. You're going to hell. It's either sinless perfection or eternal, you know, condemnation. People say, well, that, that's ridiculous. Nobody could ever keep the law perfectly. Well, that's true. That's why Jesus said with men it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible, right? Jesus came down. He lived the perfect life, the life we couldn't live. He lived the sinless life. He went to the cross as our substitute. This is the gospel, right? This is the gospel. But if God said to us, look, I promise to give you eternal life if you keep the terms of the covenant, which is sinless perfection your whole life, well, none of us would be saved. None of us would be saved. And God knew that. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith. That not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Salvation is a gift of God, not a result of your works. Because God doesn't want us in heaven boasting how we were so great and we deserve heaven. It's a gift of God. All right? In Romans chapter 4, verse 16, uh, Paul said, Therefore it is of faith. Salvation. It's of faith. That it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure. How could God promise us something that is sure if we were if it was dependent on us? Think about that. If, he, if, if eternal life was a conditional promise, a bilateral covenant, where God said, I'm going to give you eternal life if you do certain things, well, then that promise, it, it, it can't be sure. It's dependent upon us. Look, again, if the promise of salvation was based on us keeping the law, the Ten Commandments will say, the promise would be worthless because, listen, it would be based on conditions that no one could meet. None of us could meet those conditions. So that's a worthless or meaningless promise, right? I mean, let me give you an example. If, if God said, I promise to give you eternal life if you jump across the Grand Canyon, just we'll say that, and, and, and no booster rockets, no, 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 you know, you got to take a running jump like a long jumper. If you can jump across the Grand Canyon, 26 miles, by the way, you can have eternal life. Now, wouldn't that be a meaningless promise? Because none of us could satisfy the terms or the conditions. 
I mean, some would do better than others. You might get an Olympic long jumper who might take a running start. I don't know what they jump nowadays, 35 feet or whatever. He might jump 35, we'll say 40 feet. But then he goes right down, okay? He falls apart. He's going to do better than me, you know? I'm going to take a running start, get three or four. I'll try a trip as I'm, I, I stumble over this cliff, I, you know. But, but there are some who would do much better, but they were, we would all far, fall short, far short of the other side salvation, right? The same would be true if God promised the person eternal life if they lived a sinless life their entire life. That would be a worthless promise because no one could meet that condition. Some would do better than others, but all would fall way short of sinless perfection. But if God said to you and me, which he did, thankfully, I promise to give you eternal, to give you eternal life if you believe in my son. Well, now listen, that promise is attainable by anyone because everyone can believe. See, as we talked about earlier, God in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verse 31, said there's coming a day because he knew his people could never keep the law. He knew that. And they were blowing it all the time. So he said, there's coming a day that I'm, make, I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and, and all of us who believe in the Messiah. I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel, not the, like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt, my, that covenant which they broke. Moses was still up on top of, the, of Mount Sinai, getting the, t the terms of the covenant. God said to his people, you want to be enter into a covenant with me to be my people? They said, sure, we, that sounds good. All right, Moses, get up on top of the mount. I'll give you the terms of the covenant, which was the law, right? Before Moses even got down from the mountain, they have broken the first and greatest commandment. They were worshiping false gods. See, if God made us, our, made our salvation dependent in any way on our faithfulness, none of us are making it. So in the new covenant, you know what he did? He took us right out of the equation. It was a promise he made to himself. Here is a very interesting verse. You don't have to turn there. Titus 1, I think verse 1, when Paul talked about eternal life, which God promised us, listen, before time began. If God made a promise before time began, where were we? We weren't created yet, right? So who did he promise? Us? Was it a bilateral covenant? If we do certain things, he'll give us eternal life. No, we weren't even there. God made a promise with himself that he would give us eternal life based on our faith in his son. He was going to do all the work. Take it right out of our hands. And guys, that's why God could promise us eternal life the moment we put our faith in Jesus, 1 John 5, 13, because it's based on what he did and not on what we do for him. And that's why Jesus from the cross, before he bowed his head and dismissed his spirit, he said, it is what? Finished. Are you glad he didn't say, it's almost finished? <laughs> Aren't you glad the Lord didn't hang on the cross and say, well, it's almost finished. I've done my part. Now, hopefully you'll be faithful and go to church and light them candles and pray them rosaries. And, you know, you'll, you'll be faithful to do, help in the, in the soup kitchen and so on. You'll be faithful to do your part, and then you can have the eternal life that I'm offering. I'm so glad he said from the cross, it is finished, the Greek, paid in full. If it was by our works, guys, he couldn't have promised us, he promised us eternal life. Underline eternal. Uninterrupted life for all eternity from the moment we put our faith in Jesus. That's what eternal life is. It's uninterrupted life forever, eternity. I mean, how could God promise us that immediately when we receive Christ, that we have eternal life? If it was by our works, all he could have said was, well, uh, you believe in me, and that's half the battle, but now you've got to work hard and, and be good to earn the life I'm offering. And if you're good enough and work hard enough, when you die, you'll receive eternal life. You see, the fact that God promised to give us eternal life instantly and forever 
the moment we put our faith in Jesus, testifies to the fact it was all by a gift of grace and not by the works of the flesh. And that's why the writer of the Hebrews said, when it comes to the promise of eternal life that we have under the new covenant, it is a promise that is both sure and steadfast. Yes, it's sure because it doesn't depend on us. And steadfast because God is a rock, he never changes. So God is not going to say at one point, well, I changed my mind. I know I promised you eternal life. I'm not feeling it anymore. <laughs> it's sure and it's steadfast. All right, look. So far, in David's final words, he has sought to pass on to us words of wisdom concerning the importance of godly leadership. Secondly, about the assurity of God's promises. He keeps his promises. And finally, about the destiny of the wicked. Verse 6. But the sons of rebellion shall be as thorns thrust away, because they cannot be taken with hands, but the man who touches them must be armed with iron and a shaft of a spear, and they shall be utterly burned with fire in their place. David's final words of wisdom, once again, words that were inspired by the Holy Spirit, words that he wants to pass on to us, as we said, words that really matter, not trivial, meaningless junk, have to do, the final thing is have, they have to do with rebels and how they are to be dealt with by man in this life and will, and will someday be dealt with by God in the afterlife. Guys, these rebels are rebels against God. That's the idea. Those who refuse to live in obedience to what he has said in his word. The statement in verse 6 where David refers to these people as the sons of rebellion isn't just, listen, a description as to how they live. It's a designation as to who they are. They are the sons of rebellion, or in other words, the children of the first rebel in the history of the universe, the devil. Again, verse 6, the sons of rebellion shall be as the thorns thrust away, because they cannot be taken with hands, but the man who touches them must be armed with iron and a shaft of a spear, and they shall be utterly burned with fire in their place. Guys, thorns are emblematic in the scripture of the curse brought into the world by man's sin and rebellion in the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3, 18. You can check it out. But here David is likening godless, wicked people to thorns, who, so, who like literal thorns, serve no real useful purpose in the kingdom of God. Now, of course, Thorns not only don't bless the farmer, they're a curse to him. Why? Because he's got to get rid of them before he can plant his fields with, crop, with the seed. Mark 4 verse 7 says, If thorns are left in the ground, they will choke out the life of the seed. You have to first remove them. It's a curse to the farmer. Because he can't just go out there and rip them up out of the ground. Uh, these are not the little thorns maybe in your garden. These are the four to five inch thorns that you find in, in Israel. Okay, these are serious thorns. He's got to remove them with a pitchfork or some other iron implement. He can't touch them with his hands because to do so would be, would, uh, he would be injured by them. In that regard, they were not only worthless, they were dangerous. Well, a few years ago, we went, oh, actually in the 90s, I think it was, 98, 99, we uh, led a tour to Israel, and we had a young guy with us, about 23 at the time. And, of course, when you go to Israel on a tour, you stop at these different sites, and the guide will give you a, uh, the background and history, and then a pastor usually teaches. Well, we had stopped at this one site somewhere out in some kind of a wilderness area, and this young guy liked to kind of wander a little bit. I don't know. You, we'd be sitting there listening to the guide, and he's over here, and you look, he's over there. I don't, I don't know why he was so restless, right? So he walks away somewhere, and he's about maybe 50 feet away from us, and he slips on a rock, and he falls, and one of these long Judean thorns gets jammed up in his knee. Well, he pulls it out, bandages it up, thinking nothing of it. It infected his knee. He got such a bad infection, he was off of work for six months. He, he had to walk around with bags of IV, of antibiotics, for six months. That's how bad the infection was. 
when David is talking about thorns, he's not talking about the benign little prickly thorns in maybe our gardens. He's talking about these <laughs> mini stakes that you can't touch lest you get pierced by them, infected, and you might even die because of it. Not only were these thorns dangerous to crops, but they were dangerous to all who came in contact with them. The Bible clearly says that the righteous must be careful not to come in contact with the thorns of this world, the rebels. Now listen, I'm not talking about you can't come in contact with unbelievers. You should to, to preach the gospel to them. I'm talking about Christians who still maintain fellowship. That's the contact we're forbidden to have with unbelievers. We are not to have the kind of contact where we're, you know, we're in fellowship with them because that kind of contact can seriously infect our walk with God even to the point where you might walk away from God altogether. I mean, what did Paul say in 1 Corinthians 15, 33? He said, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits or morals. The thorns of this world are going to corrupt you especially if you bring them close and you're in fellowship and you're sharing your heart. and you, I know you, most of you have unsaved friends. Love them, pray for them, share with them, but do not have fellowship with them like you would a believer in Christ because you're only asking for trouble. And so guys, talking about literal thorns, the only thing they're good for is to be burned in the fire, which will be the end of all rebels against God, like thorns, they also will be burned in the fire. I won't have you turn to these. Uh, we're, our time is running out. I'll just read them to you, and then you can write them down. Isaiah 33, verse 12. And the people will be burned. Talking about rebels now, the wicked. And the people will be burned like thorns cut down that are burned in the fire. Malachi 4, verse 1. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, the day of judgment. Jesus said, talking about how Satan has sown thorns and weeds and tares into the church. He said, let them grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will send forth my reapers, the angels, who will first gather the tares, all the unbelievers who were coming to church who really hadn't received Christ who were still rebels against what God had said I'm going to first gather them as tares and they will be burned but the wheat the true believers will be gathered into my barn or into the kingdom one author said and I quote in a brilliant or in a brilliant oracle ending analogy David likened the fate of the evil in his realm to the fate of weeds in a farmer's field both would be killed with a tool of iron or the shaft of a spear and be burned up where they lie. The king's righteous zeal would purge evil from his realm through the use of deadly force where necessary. Sometimes as a society becomes more corrupt, it becomes more, well, what's the word? As society becomes more corrupt, it becomes more the responsibility of government to do what it has to do to keep people in check. You know, we are currently watching our nation descend into lawlessness and anarchy. Even as Paul prophesied, in the end times, evil men would grow worse and worse. And I, I believe this is directly related to the fact that the foundation of our nation, the Word of God, what our nation was built on, has been destroyed by godless rebels who want to do whatever seems right in their own eyes. That was the sad testimony of the period of the judges, one of the blackest in Israel's history. Six or seven times the statement, there was no king in Israel, therefore every man did whatever seemed right in his own eyes. There is no king in America. This country was founded on God and his word. He was our king. We have jettisoned God. We have sent him packing. We have kicked him out of our schools. And then we wonder why, the, as we teach kids uh, that they came from animals, why they act like animals. As we have turned our back on God and his word, we, are reap we have sown the wind, we're reaping the whirlwind, as one prophet said. 
The foundations have been destroyed, and according to Psalm 11, verse 3, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? You know, Noah Webster, one of our founding fathers, said, and I quote, All the miseries and evils which men suffer from vice, crime, ambition, injustice, oppression, slavery, and war proceed from their despising or neglecting the precepts contained in the Bible, end quote. I totally agree. And the farther we move away from God, the more we're going to see anarchy and violence because that's what's going to happen. That's just the natural result. John Adams, our second president and signer of both the Constitution and the Bill of Rights on October 11, 1798, said that there is no government, basically is what he said, there's no government in the world strong enough to force people to do something against their will. He said, you just can't coerce people to be good and moral against their will. He said, and I quote, we have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. And of course, he was talking about Christianity. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to, govern, uh, for, to the government of any other, end quote. Samuel Adams said something in 1775 that sounds like it was just spoken in the evening news. He said this, he said, when people are universally ignorant and debauched in their manners, they will sink under their own weight without the aid of foreign invaders, end quote. Well, by the way, that's what happened to the Roman Empire. The Huns didn't conquer Rome from without. They corrupted themselves from within. Rome became so debauched, so immoral, so corrupt, that it just collapsed in on itself like a rotting corpse. We're seeing... <laughs> there is no new history being written. It's just being recycled, basically. We're seeing the same thing in America. We are a country in decline because we have moved away slowly from God's word. We'll give you one more. Robert Winthrop, an early speaker of the House of Representatives, said, and I quote, Men in a word must necessarily be controlled either by a power within, that would be the Holy Spirit, or by a power without them, either by the word of God or by the strong arm of man, government, either by the Bible or by the bayonet. And that's what David is basically saying. When you have wicked rebels in a society who refuse you know, to, to, to honor God and, and bow to his authority and give their life to Christ, we would say, well, they're, they're going to become more and more wicked, and then government is going to have to step it up more and more to control them with more laws, uh, greater punishment, and so on. We're seeing it in our own country. David said it here again, verse 7. But the man who touches them, these rebels, comes in contact with the wicked rebels of a society is the idea, must be armed with iron and the shaft of a spear. Guys, pray for our nation. We are in deep trouble, and I fear it's only going to get worse before it gets better. It won't really get better until Jesus comes back and fixes the mess. But until then, as, uh, as the writer said in 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14, God promised if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, seek my face, and pray, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear their prayer from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. That's our responsibility as the people of God, to pray and, of course, to live righteously ourselves. Look, David's words, we're, we're done. But David's words, the wisdom, words of wisdom summed up, in any nation there are those who honor God and are blessed, and then though, there are those who rebel against God and are cursed. Look, if I were in David's shoes, sandals, and I, and I was tr giving my final words to my nation, not that they would listen to me. So anybody who would listen, okay? I'd say the same thing, basically. I'm not a king or a leader like that, a president. So I wouldn't maybe talk about the importance of godly leadership, although I might. But I would say this, like David is saying. I would say that we are imperfect sinners who don't deserve anything from God, especially not eternal life, right? Isn't that what David is saying? You know, I tell you what the ideal, but I certainly haven't risen to the level of the ideal. Look at my family. What a mess. And David's family was a mess. He said, but thank God God made a covenant with me based not on my goodness or faithfulness, based on his goodness and faithfulness. And so like David, I would say to people, and we do even now, that even though we're imperfect sinners, God loves us. 
And even though we don't deserve any blessings from him, especially not eternal life, he loves imperfect sinners and he's inviting them to be a part of an everlasting, unconditional covenant ratified by the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. A covenant that is entered into not by being good, lighting candles, doing all kinds of good works in the community. I'm not putting doing good works to help the poor down. I'm just saying they're not going to get you into heaven. This covenant is a covenant I enter into by faith, the new covenant. I thank God for the eternal life he's offering me as a gift. I say, God, I believe in you, Lord. I believe in your son, Jesus. I believe that you're the son of God, savior of the world, died for my sins, rose again the third day from the dead, who's coming someday to judge the living and the dead and to bring a kingdom that will have no end. I want to be a part of that kingdom, Lord. I receive you as my Lord and savior. God says, I promise you, you will have everlasting life. In fact, you have it now and it will never be taken from you. But all those who refuse God's offer and instead choose to go on living in rebellion against him, well, they're going to be judged someday, listen, without mercy. Proverbs 29, verse 1. He was often rebuked and hardens his neck, will suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. No mercy. Colossians 3, 25, Paul said, but he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. You want mercy? Today's the day of mercy. You want mercy from, for your sins? Receive Christ now as your Lord and Savior. This is the day of salvation. This is the day of mercy. If you wait until you stand before God in the day of judgment, there's no mercy. There is just judgment and punishment. Look, if the Holy Spirit could come down here and meet with you and say, look, I like to talk to you about things that really matter in life. You want to have coffee? I mean, not coffee. You want to sit, talk a little? I would say that to you. But I'm sure the Holy Spirit wouldn't say coffee. But, but if the Lord, the Holy Spirit could, would come down and say to you, look, I want to tell you about what really matters in life. You think you'd want to listen to that? I think you would. Well, he's basically doing that through David. He's telling you what really matters in life. What really matters in life is to love God, give your life to him, obey what he has said. Because to rebel, well, there's going to be judgment. And God doesn't want to judge you. He loves you. He gave his son to die for you, that you would not have to be judged with the wicked. If you refuse Jesus Christ, if you reject him as your Lord and Savior, then what else is God going to do? He has to punish sin. He punished his son that you might have forgiveness of sin. If you reject Christ, there is no more there's no more forgiveness, but only the fearful expectation of fiery judgment. Look, I'll leave you with David's son Solomon's final words. They're, they're, these final, one day I'll do a message, words that matter, and I'll pull out some of the final farewell addresses throughout the Bible. Okay, you see it Moses, you see it Solomon, David, Joshua, Paul, Jesus. Someday we'll do that, okay? But let me leave you with the final words of David's son, Solomon, in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, starting with verse 11. He said, the words of the wise are like cattle prods, painful but helpful. Not easy to hear things you don't want to hear, but if you listen, they'll help you. Their collected sayings are like a nail-studded stick with which a shepherd drives the sheep. But my child, let me give you some further advice. Be careful. For writing books is endless and much study wears you out. That's the whole story. Here, here now is my final conclusion. So here's, here's the bottom line. These are the words I want to pass along to you that really matter. Here's the, 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 the whole course of life. Fear God and obey his commands, for this is everyone's duty. God will judge us for everything we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad if you reject Christ if you reject Christ because Hebrews 4.13 it says that um, nothing in creation is hidden from God's sight but all things are open and naked in the eyes of him to whom we must someday give an account and Jesus said you know what every thought every idle word a person speaks are going to have to give account, account for in the day of judgment unless you receive Christ. Because then all your sins are put on him. 
And on the day of judgment, you are not judged with the wicked. You are rewarded as a child of God. So important words. Um, may God give us grace to listen. Because all the wise words, wise words in the world mean nothing if people don't listen and take them to heart. May God give us the grace to do that very thing. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Your word is truth. Your word is wisdom from above. And Lord, we pray that you would give everybody in this room, Lord, a reality check. If they don't know you, if they're playing games, if they think that by coming to church that that makes, makes them right with you, Lord, give them grace to realize it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but by your mercy, you have saved us. Titus 3, 5. And Lord, we pray that you would touch every heart in this room and everyone who will be listening to this message at some time online or on the radio, that, Lord, they would all examine themselves carefully to see if they really have put their faith in you and their life has changed as a result, that they are bearing fruit. Because if they're not bearing fruit, they're a thorn. And thorns are not children of God, and they will be burned someday. Lord, give us grace, those who know you, that we would bear more fruit, much fruit, that we would glorify you in these last days through all we do and say. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you that there's a day coming when the Lord, as somebody has said, for a righteous person, a Christian, this life is as, is as bad as it's ever going to be for us. If you're an unbeliever, this life is as good as it's ever going to be. Thank you, Lord, that for us who know you, this life is nothing. These light afflictions are only temporary and are building for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. We don't look at the things that are seen. We keep our eyes on the things that are unseen, the heavenly places. And we thank you, Lord, that someday we will be taken to be with you soon, to live in your kingdom forever. Father, we thank you. We ask all this now in Jesus' precious name. Amen.